I'm reading this morning uh, the scripture from Mark, chapter 10, verse 17 through 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go. Sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields. For my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Here ends the reading of the scripture. So, when you preach from the lectionary, you have to take what the lectionary gives you. I think it's a nice discipline to keep from avoiding those tough passages that nobody wants to deal with. This is a tough passage, particularly in a privileged congregation. On the surface, what Jesus says to the rich young man is challenging, harsh even, In short, Jesus is asking the man to do the impossible. Scholars have long speculated just what Jesus means here. Is Jesus really saying that rich people can't or won't get into heaven? Is it truly easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle One popular theory is that there was a door, a gate into the city of Jerusalem through which only a person could fit. And people of privilege, wealthy people, could afford a camel or an animal to carry all of their possessions, and they couldn't get through that door. It was called the needle's eye. And so that that gate was open to those who were unencumbered by possessions in some way. And that's a nice idea, but the problem with that interpretation is that that door is not written about for till about 800 years after Jesus, so he's probably not making that reference. And that leaves us still to wrestle with these tough words. Is Jesus offering an indictment of wealth itself or the wealthy? And is Jesus saying that they can't or won't get into the kingdom? All that seems contrary to everything that Jesus has taught or said 
or practiced. I read the passage over and over again this week, hoping that something new would stand out for me. And a couple of things did. First, Jesus tells the young man what is expected of him. The scripture tells us the man went away grieving. Now, I've always understood that that grief was about having been asked too much of, to let go of his wealth, that Jesus wants more of him than he's capable to give, and he's grieved. But the man already reached out to Jesus. Scripture tells us that the young man already knows the commandments and is faithful to what God expects of him. Why would he be seeking something more? If he knows that God wants of him, what God wants of him, and is assured that he is doing what God wants, why would he have doubts, questions about his access to eternal life? Is there something more this young man is seeking? We all know what it's like to get what we want or to have what we want and still feel empty. In fact, sometimes we are prevented from deeper spiritual understanding by the stuff in our lives. We think that they're going to fulfill us, that if I could only have that nicer car, that bigger house, that remodeled bathroom, then my life will feel fulfilled and complete. But it doesn't always work that way, does it? Sometimes our stuff, our busyness, our privilege gets in the way of spiritual fulfillment. We cannot provide a deeper understanding or sense of purpose or peace or assurance that we long for with those things. They're transient. Jesus puts it another way in the Gospel of Matthew. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Mark says, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. Maybe the possessions are the source of the grief themselves and not Jesus' challenge to get rid of them. There's something missing in this young man's life that his possessions can't fill, a void that they can't heal or make well. And maybe that's his grief. We've all experienced being encumbered by our stuff as a third-generation borderline hoarder. I am a fan of the show Hoarders. Have you ever watched it? Uh -huh, I'm getting some nods there. It is both entertaining and terribly sad. And I have to admit, I've already admitted I'm a coveter, right? Okay? I admit now that there is a guilty pleasure in feeling better about myself because I'm not as bad as the people on that show, right? But what's interesting about that show is the source of the hoarding. Without fail, there is a pain, a grief, a trauma, a deep longing that they're trying to fill with literal junk. And those who come to help to intervene on the show show great compassion in allowing those hoarders to identify the power that stuff has over them what it represents. They don't just come in and say, this is garbage, throw it out. They sit with them and they process with them what this represents. They're giving, given agency in what stays and what goes because it's a grieving process. When he heard what Jesus said, the young man was shocked 
and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Things and money and privilege are not the problem here. It is the power those things have in our lives. But another thing that stood out for me in this reading is that Jesus loved the man. The scripture bothers to tell us that Jesus loved him. Jesus doesn't stand in judgment here. He sees the grief and the pain of this man and offers a solution out of love. Jesus sees what is burdening the young man and his longing to be right with God and loves him enough to tell him what he needs to do, how to find what he seeks. That healing comes from recognizing the promises and possibilities of God. There's so much in our lives that can keep us from seeing what is right in front of us. There are things that get in the way and limit those possibilities. Fear, lack of trust, overcommitment, even stubbornness. And sometimes privilege is our worst enemy. It leads us to believe falsely that things are of our making. And it keeps us from seeing the divine blessings at work in our lives. When we focus or rely on that privilege, we put ourselves in a position of having to protect it. It is the source of our identity, our comfort, our strength, our meaning as a human. And we have to protect it. If you've watched Hoarders, you know that a situation that any of us, I imagine, would be appalled by. Things like dirty pizza boxes and rotting pieces of food covered in rat droppings would have little emotional meaning, and yet they do for those people. And they're put in a position, because it has meaning, of protecting it. And the idea of somebody coming in and just throwing the garbage out is more than they can bear. We can do all the right things, this passage tells us. We can live by the rules, as this young man does, but still fail to find fulfillment because we don't see the need or potential around us. After this exchange with the rich young man, the disciples are left wondering, well, who then can be saved? They, like the young man and like many of us still, are operating on the assumption that there is something we need to do to be saved. That salvation is earned, merited. We are, after all, people of the Protestant work ethic. And I didn't mention, but it's a topic for another sermon, that that is a false promise all its own, too. The young man asks, as we do, what do we need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle. There's nothing we can do. Nothing we can do. It's impossible for us. But not for God. This is where grace comes in. God's love and grace are not earned or merited. There's nothing we can do. For a rich young man longing for something more in his life, he may have expected his privilege to allow him access, that he could earn, that he could merit, that he could buy his way into eternal life. Truly, that's how the world has been for him. It's interesting because the scripture bothers to tell us that he's young. It might be an indication that this wealth and privilege are not his. 
that it's his inheritance. And therefore, this would be a young man who's used to everything coming to him. He can buy what he wants or needs, but still, he's longing. He's a good man. He knows and lives by the commandments, but he longs for something more. But his desire can't be bought. There's no check he can write to get grace. And maybe that's why he's grieving too. He's reached the end of his resources and they don't fulfill him. It's impossible. It sometimes feels that way, doesn't it? Maybe you too are longing for something more, something more meaningful, purposeful. Maybe all your trying has gotten you nowhere. It feels impossible. We can't fit a camel through the eye of a needle. But God can. With God, all things are possible. Can we let go of what stands in our way and let God do the impossible in our lives? Let us pray. God of love, you call us to give ourselves to you and to work towards your realm on earth. Sometimes we cannot imagine your possibilities. Sometimes we value our possessions more than we value your love and your promise. Sometimes we don't want to give up anything. Please help us to find our way towards living more faithfully as your followers. Challenge us to be willing to risk ourselves. Show us what we need to give up to be closer to you. Amen.